Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Gordon Ritchie. My pronouns are he, him, and sometimes why. The reason for this addition to my pronouns is because our service this morning will give the opportunity to ask questions about UCE, about one another, and about our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison. What has been on your heart lately? What is confusing you? What are you happy about? Well, I'm happy to be here with all of you in the sanctuary and to be joined by friends and members who are with us online. It is good to be together. We are one of two Unitarian churches in the Edmonton area, the other being Westwood Unitarian Congregation. There are many exciting things that are happening within our church community, and to kick things off, I'm going to ask Karen to come, come forward, and then we have an announcement from Donna and then from Reverend Rosemary. Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Blita. My pronouns are she, hers. And Donna and I are both talking about the garage sale. But my, I need help with putting out the garage sale signs. So preferably, we would do that Thursday around noon. But if, if necessary, we can also put them out the Wednesday night. On, in the lobby, on the table, you'll find my phone number saying, help with garage sale signs. You can call me and let me know because it's really important people find us. Karen is being modest. She also does a lot of checking prices online and posting online. So she does a lot more than looking after signs. But so. Um, We've got an excellent team. We've been working pretty hard, and uh, we've got um, a lot of stuff out there, and most of it is priced. So you can do some shopping after church for a little while. Then we're taking the rest of the day off and starting again tomorrow. Um, I've got pretty well most of the cashiers that I need. Uh, I need someone for hot dogs on the Saturday. David Hagel is not able to do um, that duty. He's not feeling well and he's moving. So two big things on his on his mind right now. Um, and anyone who can drop in on Thursday afternoon, Friday afternoon, Friday anytime and Saturday would be appreciated because we always need people Kind of, you know, strolling the aisles and putting things from below the tables onto the tables as the tables clear. So, um, uh, yes, you're welcome anytime, all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rosemary Morrison, I, and the, the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, I forgot about that part, and uh, my pronouns are she and hers, and I am the minister at this church, and it is my pleasure and honor to be here and to serve this congregation. So I have two announcements this Monday, I guess that's tomorrow, uh, at U, is uh, one of our last UUs on tap at Brewster's, I'll be there um, I hope to arrive around 5.30, come for a meal, or come later on just for a cup of tea or something, but it's an opportunity for folks to get to know one another in a relaxed and, and um, relaxed and gentle atmosphere, and people can, can be laid back and nobody has to do too much uh, to, do, to uh, get a meal or a cup of tea. Um, so this is the question box service, and there is paper and pencils at the back of the sanctuary. If you would have a question in your mind that you would like to ask during the message part of this service, um, go and grab one um, and write it down on the pencil, and there's a basket. You can put your name or not. Uh, it's up to you. It's nice if I do know who the question is coming from, and then we can have a conversation afterwards. An anonymous piece of feedback doesn't really get us too far. It's better to have a, 
a chance to have a conversation. Uh, if you're online, um, you can put your question into the chat and during the time of the questions, um, someone from up there will read it to me and then I will repeat it back into the mic. Um, so you can either write down your question or you can come to this mic during the, the, the sermon part, the message part of the service and ask your question into the mic. I think that's, is that it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you all. I'm going to begin the question and answer this morning by asking you, the members of our congregational audience, a few questions. So I'll divide you into two teams, Team Unitarian and Team Universalism. Team Unitarian will be on my left side, Team Universalism will be on my right. We'll begin with Team Universe Unitarian. Team Unitarian, the Unitarian Church is liberal, religious, multi-generational community. Is this statement true or false. It is true. Thank you. Well done. Over to Team, Unit, uh, team Universalism. Uh, we celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritual questing individuals joined in common support and action. True or false? Again, that is true. Thank you, Team Universalism. Uh, back to Team Unitarian. We welcome diversity, pursue the common good, and work for justice. Is this statement true or false? It is true. We now, have, we now have Team Unitarian in the lead, back to Team Universalist. We believe in the compassion of the human heart, the warmth of community, and the search for meaning in our lives, true or false? Again, that is true. Our teams are tied. The next question is for both teams. Listen carefully. All those present in the sanctuary have either silenced or turned off their electronic <laughs> devices that they might have with them this morning. Is this statement true or false? Well, it better be true. Congratulations to both our teams. Thank you for playing. We'll begin our service with station identification, also referred to as a prelude. land acknowledgement this morning, I'd like to read you part of a letter that came my way this past week. Uh, it's a letter that I understand has been posted in the Muscogee's Cultural College. It's a letter that was circulated by the Department of Indian Affairs, October, uh, December 15th, 1921. It reads as follows. It is observed with alarm that the holding of dances by the Indians on their reserves is on the increase, and that these practices tend to disorganize the efforts which the department is putting forth to make them self-supporting. I have therefore to direct you to use your utmost endeavors to dissuade the Indians from excessive indulgence in their practice of dancing. You should suppress any dances which cause waste of time interfere with the occupations of the Indians, and settle them for serious work, injury that health, injury, injure their health, or encourage them in sloth or idleness. You should also dissuade and, if possible, prevent them from leaving their reserves for the purpose of attending fairs, exhibitions, etc., when their absence would result in their own farming and other interests being neglected. The letter goes on, but I think you get the point. I'm not sure what form of dancing the author is referring to, but if he is referring to their traditional dances, I for one have had the honor to witness the power, the grace, the exuberance, and the beauty of these traditional dances. I'm grateful for those who have kept these important traditions alive. And as we live here on Treaty 6 territory, may we continue to honor and respect the traditions of all First Peoples of Canada as we continue to work together on our path of reconciliation. As we light our chalice, we'll hear the words of Marilyn Falskowski, and I'd like to invite Yvonne Ford to light our chalice this morning.
we welcome you. We know you come here from different pla- for different reasons, to find community, to seek your spiritual and personal truths, to question, to nurture your heart and soul, to be nurtured, to explore new ideas, to find comfort, and perhaps find the answers to some of your bigger questions. We welcome you. We know you have come from different places, different religions, different beliefs, and different backgrounds. We hope you find here comfort, connection, challenge, and love. We hope you find ways to provide outreach to others in our congregation, in our local community, and in the world community. Thank you, Yvonne. Our opening hymn this morning is number 354, We Laugh, We Cry. The text will be coming up on the screen behind me as well as on the screens of those who are with us online. I invite you to rise as you are willing and able as we sing number 354, We Laugh, We Cry.
even to question truly is an answer. Yes, indeed. Well, it's time for a service leader reflection. I would like to continue with our question and answer theme and ask a question that I'm sure is burning in the hearts of many. What's up with these service leaders? We never used to have them, what gives? Well, I went back in my memory and while attending services at, services at our former building, now I could be wrong, but if my memory serves me correctly, I believe that there were maybe four people involved in a Sunday morning service. There was the minister, of course. There was one person working the sound system, which, by the way, involved turning a switch on at the beginning of the service and then turning a switch off at the end of the service. <laughs> Things have changed quite dramatically. There was at least one usher, and there was always a person making coffee. I took a look at the Sunday service list for this Sunday, and I saw that there were no less than 14 individuals who have volunteered their time and energy making this service possible. For me, that speaks volumes not only of the development of our outreach, but also the dedication that our members have for the well-being of this congregation. Now let's go back to the service leaders. I counted 19 names on our service leader roster. These are people who assist our minister on the Sunday morning services, and some of them have also been service creators. Now, one of the main purposes of the service leader, of the service leader role, is to have members participate in the service. Before this role was implemented, uh, with the guidance of Reverend Rosemary, a service leader guide book was created, complete with text to assist new service leaders. But as time went by, many of the service leaders no longer felt the need to use this guidebook. Now they dive into their own libraries or personal experience to create or find text they deem appropriate for their service. They speak from the heart when referring to land acknowledgement. They are not required to offer a reflection, but pretty much all of them do now. And I'm so proud of them for taking a risk to do so. Their reflections also allow us to hear a new perspective on the monthly theme. But more importantly, it gives us an opportunity to get to know members of our congregation on a deeper level. And isn't that what it's all about? In the words of Yvonne Miro, we create the congregation, oh sorry, we are the congregation that we create every day. And I'm so grateful for those who give of their time to create this beloved community. I'll conclude with the words of Melanie Beattie, referring to gratitude. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion into clarity. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, a stranger into a friend. Gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for tomorrow, and creates a vision for tomorrow. May it be so. As we prepare to share our abundance, I would like to tell you a little bit about our charity of the month. We've been hearing about this wonderful organization throughout April. Inspired by the ideals and philosophies of Mahatma Gandhi, Child Haven International is a registered not-for-profit charity founded in 1985. They assist women and children in developing countries who are in need of food, education, health care, shelter and clothing, emotional and moral support. One half of the unidentified cash received during the month of April is given to Child Haven International. For those of you who are with us online, I encourage you to vi visit the Child Haven International website to make a donation or go to the UCE website. 
Now, one of the purposes of our church community is to encourage all who gather here to be more generous in spirit and action. We take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support this self-sustaining church in all its many ministries. Now, many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawals from their account, and we are very grateful for that. So as the ushers receive the offering, I would ask them to come on down. like to lead you in a moment or a time of meditation. And as we prepare to do that, I invite you to take a long, slow, deep breath. Allow your mind to quiet and, or to fill with questions. As you breathe in, try to notice those little places inside your mind or your body where there might be tension or stress. Allow the chair to hold you, to envelop you. Lean into it. I'm going to read a poem by David White called Start Close In. Followed by some silence, and I will read it again. We'll have a little bit more silence, and then we will sing our meditation hymn, Meditation on Breathing, to end our meditation time, after which we'll move into candles of joy and concern. Take a couple more cleansing breaths. Maybe you found the meditation, hand meditation helpful last week. Maybe you want to take your hands and give them a squeeze or a little rub. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing, close in. The step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way of starting the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. To find another's voice, find, follow your own voice. Wait until that voice becomes a private ear listening to another. Start right now, take a small step. You can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other for your own. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in, the step 
you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way of starting the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. To find another's voice, follow your own voice. Wait until that voice becomes a private ear listening to another. Start right now. Take a small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other for your own. And I'll just share some, a minute or so of silence, after which Karen will bring us in on meditation on breathing. The words will appear on the screen. First words are breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. in the Unitarian Universalist congregations across the world. So like candles of joy and concern. Some smaller congregations speak to those candles every week. We speak to them once in a while. This morning, our, we're lighting silent candles um, of joy and or concern. The tables are ready for you if you would like to light a candle of something that is on your heart something that has made you jump for joy or squeal with delight, or something that has touched your heart in a real or profound way. I invite you now to light a candle of joy or concern.
And I'll ask Gordon to light one last candle for all the joys and concerns that we hold dear in our hearts that may come to the light on another day. This next reading is entitled, No Questions Asked, Love. Excerpt from Stubborn Grace, Faith, Mental Illness, and Demanding a Blessing by Kate Landis. In my life, I have received a big engulfing, no questions asked love. From old church ladies who wince at my blue hair, but love me anyway, from my do we have to talk about feelings little brother when I was shattered into depression, weeping shards on the kitchen floor and he sat beside me. From seminary friends after I told them terrified that I wondered if a person with my mental health history could be, should be a minister and they said hell yes from church board members after I shoved my foot halfway down my throat, from nurses in psych wards, I am broken, yet beloved. In all the moments when I needed love but didn't deserve it, hadn't earned it, couldn't appreciate it, love enveloped me, a bounty without end. I saw this bounty in my congregation, fearless, unshakable love from each of this world's broken souls. It's why I fell in love with them. Every Sunday we say, whoever you are, wherever you come from, whoever you love, wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. It knocks the wind right out of me. I didn't know the human heart could hold so much love before I met this congregation. Reverend Rosemary has found a video by one of my new favorite artists, Lee Morris. It's entitled, Lone Wolf. I'm not a lone wolf, and I never was anything I achieve. I achieve it because I am standing on the shoulders of an infinite many, seen and unseen. I'm not a lone wolf, and I never was anything I achieve. I achieve it because I am riding on a tidal wave of universal longing. I'm dropping the high, I'm claiming the we, I'm feeling the everything inside of me. I'm dropping the mind, I'm claiming the us, cause the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I'm dropping the high, I'm claiming the we, I'm feeling the everything inside of me. I'm dropping the mind, I'm claiming the ours, cause I recognize how connected we are. 
Every tear that was ever shed, and every prayer that was ever said, and every gesture on every day weaves us into the dancing. This is love's way, oh, every tear that was ever shed, and every prayer that was ever said, and every step on every day leads us into belonging. This is love's I'm way I'm 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 I'm
um, one another and decide if you want to put uh, something on and in that way become engaged. So I think that if a person didn't want to do anything with the congregation, didn't come to some of those things like the movie night, I think it would be hard to feel engaged. But there's lots of places to participate. Um, there's teams that you might want to participate in, and, but that doesn't mean you need to come to church or here on Sunday morning. Um, the broader UU movement question, there are, there's a team that's been developed, and this is their first year, and there are some broader conversations around what is the future of Unitarian Universalism in Canada and in the United States. The UU Ministers Association is also having these conversations, and how do we stay re relevant and vital in, in the communities and in the world, really? How, how do we be, stay vibrant? How do we become vibrant? How do we keep... Um, our congregations from shrinking. So there's a new team uh, called LIFES, L-I-F-E-S, and it stands for things, and it would have been really smart of me to have looked that up and brought you the name of that. Um, but it is um, populated by um, a board, a couple of board members, um, the executive director and some lay people, and uh, a student minister, our Alara Stefania Godet is on that team, and, um, and a couple of ministers. So it's a big team. Oh, and a religious education professional as well. It's a big team, and they're having this very conversation. How do we engage people in these conversations around vitality and vibrancy and, and deep theological thinking? Um, and I'm really excited to see what they're, what they're going to come up with. Like I said, it's the new this year, and um, their main goal this year was to, to really get to know one another and become super comfortable with each other and with the questions. So, do we have another question? We do. do we? And the mic is open, and I'll go and turn it on. If you have a question, if you want to come to the mic, if you want to get a piece of paper and bring it up, um, I'll just sit over here. So we have a question. Um, actually, a bit of a three-part question. Oh. oh, and some more that just came in. Some came hot off the Fantastic. press. Love it. The ink is still wet. <laughs> uh, this was regarding covenant. A uh, bit of a three-part question. Um, you, uh, Reverend Rosemary, you keep talking about covenant. Why do you do that? <laughs> what does it mean to be out of covenant with someone Third part, what do I do if someone says, I am out of covenant? Covenant. Your time starts now. My time starts now, okay. Why do I keep talking about covenant? Because uh, UCE hasn't had a covenant uh, in kind of written up in, in, in our minds. It's not something that's been part of this congregation's history. And we're not a creedal congregation, a denomination, we're a covenantal congregation. So it's not just uh, us as parishioners and ministers that live within covenant, it's the entire denomination. That's what our bedrock is, is we're a covenantal community, we're a covenantal denomination. So to my way of thinking, if it's not something that it has been discussed a lot about and that everybody understands already implicitly and as part of their being, then we need to talk about it a lot because it's new. What's the second part? What does it mean to be out of covenant with someone? To have broken the covenant. So say, um, say something is said publicly or to another person that is harmful and that maybe would have hurt their feelings had they, had they heard about it or uh, complaining about a structure or a part of the congregation to somebody else. Um, so something that could be harmful, that could uh, damage relationships, uh, that the person wouldn't want to hear if they overheard it, that would be hurtful and harmful. Then, so if I said to somebody, Wendy, can I use your name? Thank you. If I said, you know that Wendy? I never see her doing a darn thing around here. 
which isn't the truth. I've seen her every mm. weekday out in there and in the pew every Sunday. I, I don't even know why she bothers. Or did you hear what she said or did you hear what she did? That's harmful, right? That's a harmful thing to say about someone. And then that person who said it would be out of covenant. The thing for them to do, then the person would hopefully say, hey, I'm really uncomfortable with what you just said. You're out of covenant. That is not okay to say. We love Wendy. Um, and if you've got something you want to say about Wendy, you better darn say it to her. And if you don't have the bravery to say it to her face, then just keep your mouth zipped. So what do you do if you're out of covenant? Um, there is a committee on shared ministry. If you're out of covenant with me or if you're upset with me in any way, um, and I think there is a, converse, a question about the committee later on, isn't mm -hmm. there? Yeah. If we have time. Yeah, if we have time. Um, if, if this person said, whoa, you're out of covenant, I don't like what you just said, um, then they, the two of them could talk about it, right, and solve it on your own. And then the person would say, oh, yeah, you're right, I shouldn't have said that. Hopefully, the person would think that. Or if you've got a problem with Wendy, you need to go and talk to them directly. And then Wendy and that person would have a conversation. And then you would get back into covenant. So to get back into covenant with someone, there needs to be a conversation, most effectively one-on-one, -on -one, and solve the problem between you, where there's some restoration, some forgiveness, uh, maybe even a hug afterwards, or a handshake at the very least. So trying to solve the problem right there at the first level. And if that doesn't work, there is a process that will, be, that will become more clear. But if that doesn't work, and the problem isn't with me, come to me. I'm your first line in this kind of thing, and I'll help you sort it through. Okay? Reverend Rosemary, let's go on to our next question. It was uh, brought to me by one of our congregation audience members. Uh, this um, individual has written, my understanding of Unitarianism is that one can believe anything, but can one believe that Jesus is divine? Can I look at that question? Yes, indeed. And could you please pass me my water? Yes. I love this question. <laughs> well, you can't believe just anything. I think that's a um, misnomer. Um, I remember when I became a Unitarian Universalist, my mom said to me, what do you want to join them for? They don't believe in anything. Hmm. So they believe in everything and they believe in nothing. It kind of was her, her thought. Um, we can certainly pursue our own religious or our own spiritual paths, be it or decide we don't want to believe in anything. That's okay too. But because we're in a non-creedal community, we're not going to tell you what to believe, but we're going to tell you how to act. That we're a covenantal community. So you can't believe that you can harm someone, or you can't believe that you're going to move, do something against our principles. So you can't believe anything, but you can certainly explore any avenue of spirituality or... Um, religious practices that you wish. And the, the joy of it is, is that in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, you have an opportunity to do that alongside others that are also living in covenant and wish to pursue their search for truth and meaning, as our principles say. And that includes if you wish to believe that Jesus is divine, Absolutely. There's lots of closet Christians in Unitarian Universalist churches. And it's really hard for them to come out of the closet. I've talked about this a lot because sometimes um, people don't, aren't treated well enough when they make that claim. And so we need to be careful around that, that it's okay to believe in the, the teachings of Jesus, in the teachings of Muhammad, to follow the path of Buddha, and all are sacred, and all are well. Great, great question. Thank you. Just a little heads up, we're going to be pursuing this a little bit more at our next Coriolis service, so stay tuned. Another question from our congregational audience. 
What would it take to get everyone in UCE's congregation to be enthusiastic about change, the opportunity to embrace new ways of being? Reverend Rosemary. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's an easy one. That's an easy, easy Magic one. Unicorn. Magic unicorn, yeah. Uni the unicorn, which is the mascot of the Unitar Canadian Unitarian Council, by the way. Uni the unicorn. <laughs> I kid you not, there is, a unitary, there is a unicorn costume that is worn at, at conferences. Um, change is hard for everyone, and change at, in a congregational level is even harder. Um, often it's the leaders of the congregation in meetings that not everybody is in, they make decisions and put, uh, implement changes, and people are like, what? When did we decide we were going to do that? Or even if it was like a year ago and we all talked about it and had a couple dozen meetings about it, some people aren't going to remember that, and that's okay, because not everyone goes to everything. I think we have to remember that change is tolerated at a glacial speed, in the, in the church life, um, and change has to be only at the speed of tolerance. So unless, so it has to be slow. And sometimes I think, oh, I'm just, I'm going too slow with this congregation. We need to have this and this and this and this and this in place, and then we have to do that and that and that and that, and then, and, and I haven't done enough. And then somebody says, there's just been so many changes. You've done so much, I, I can't keep up. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Really? So there has to be a, a, a me happy medium in there someplace where people can handle the change that's, that is happening. Um, and it's, sometimes I think, I'm not really doing anything. And then people tell me that, oh yeah, there's, there's a few things you've done. Like, but then when I do a board report, I find out that I did do a couple of things. But um, embracing change is hard for a congregation. And I think that... Uh, the, the more input and the more buy-in and the more things that happen at the, that the, that is done from the people, not from me or from the board or from the committees or teams, but things that rise up out of the congregation that you want to do, those are the changes that are really embraced where people buy in. Sue? Hi, Hi, I'm Sue Lynch. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I didn't get this into the basket. It's, I wasn't it's fine. fast I like, enough. I love this. Okay. Um, I, I guess my anchor into the Unitarian Church is through Sunday services. Um, I participate in other things as well, uh, but it's the Sunday service that I find is my anchor. And I know in the past, um, I've thought that having themes that we work from would probably be a good idea, uh, although I never really put any hard thought to that. But uh, since you've been here, you've introduced the idea of themes that would guide a year-long arc. Uh, and I've tried looking at soul matters plus the themes as they're uh, they come along in the Sunday service, and I'm, I'm having trouble with w what, all I can describe is a remoteness, and I don't know what that, whether that's the right word, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't find the themes are kind of anchoring me into something that's really critical on our minds or, or something like that. When I went into the soul matters, um, a friend in the congregation suggested I might want to have a close look at joining in on that. What I found was that the soul matters were, um, I, I think what they were was an American orientation. Mm -hmm. The readings were American literature and, and that kind of thing. And I found that all that did was enhance my disconnected feeling. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, where are the themes coming from? How was it decided that we would anchor onto those particular themes? Is there another way of coming at the theme idea, which I think has got real merit, but anchoring the themes more within 
um, our experiences here. Does that question come through? Okay? That's a great right. question. Mm. Thank you. So Soul Matters is an organization affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Association, which is the U.S. It, and it is U.S. based. It's um, headed up by a fellow by the name of Reverend Scott Taylor. And you'll probably see if you're looking in the Soul Matters theme yeah. packet that quite, he does quite a bit of the writing as well. And they are U.S. centric, so which annoys me as well. Um, I think um, we're not going to find a Unitarian based theme packet that has more of a Canadian bent. Um, it's just, unless you want to write that up yourself, what would be really fun um, is. Uh, if uh, there could be a group formed and take the Soul Matters theme packets, they come out two months in advance, or take the themes and have a group that does some, some writing or some looking at um, how to Canadianize them. Some congregations, uh, Reverend Samaya Oakley uses the, the theme from last year, and it gives her an opportunity or a team an opportunity to go through the packets. And, and find some more Canadian um, content. Uh, it's a ton of work. Um, so the themes are chosen. We actually just, I just actually voted on them. So the themes, uh, the themes are chosen by the people that buy the packets. So everybody, every organized, every church or congregation or whatever uh, gets an opportunity to vote we're given several choices and an overarching choice for an overarching theme for the year. And that vote just came, uh, I don't know, last week or the week before, and the themes for the new year have just been announced. I think the thing that I like the most about using the themes is that it does give us a focus. It does kind of like, as Unitarian Universalist, as a Unitarian Universalist minister, the world, Every, every piece of writing, every religion I can pick from. I don't know about you, but the beginning of a funnel that is that big to try to figure out how, what to do on a Sunday morning week after week is, I, I really like the fact that they have curated for us an opportunity to um, have a kind of hone in on something. And there's just so many different ways a person could go with the themes that it is probably really hard to like, go deep on one thing. Um, I do encourage anyone, I encourage you, Sue, to, to be part of a, a Soul Matters t uh, group next year. It might, you might find it a little more helpful, I don't know. Or find a few people that w would like to look at it in a different way and look at it with you. And, and do some other research to find. I would love it if somebody did some research to find some Canadian content for us, for chalice lightings and, and that kind of thing. I find sometimes there isn't much, and I, and I just end up writing what um, our chalice lighting and extinguishing that kind of thing to make it more relevant. Have I answered your questions? Uh, partly, yes. And Sue, so just let you know, I have my schedule opened up for next year for service leaders, just so you know. Thank you. And, and feel free to make an appointment with me and we can discuss it further. Thank you. Uh, Erica. Hi. My name is Erica Deneve. My pronouns are she, they, and I also did not write anything down because I'm horrible. <laughs> that's why there's a mic. Um, my question is related to this, though, and that's why I wanted to come up and talk about it. So. Um, this has been sort of brewing in my mind for a few Sundays now, and my question is around the term worship, hmm. because that's kind of a triggering word for me, hmm. and I think that it maybe is for a lot of sort of younger generation people, not that I'm young, <laughs> but hmm. the idea, like for me, coming to a Sunday service, I am looking for nourishment and connection and spiritual exploration, definitely, but I'm not here to worship anybody or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what that worship word 
means to you and what you think that it should mean to us mm. as a congregation? Mm. Mm. Those are good questions. Uh, thank you, Erica. Um, probably we've got time for one more after one this. One more question. Yeah. Um, so the, the uh, root of the wor word means something of worth. So to me, the word means that we are doing something of worth together. Um, one, I, I understand that the word is triggering for folks, so I try not to use it very much. Um, I, I don't think, it, it doesn't matter, but I, I do try to use other words rather than worship um, because I do know that it's triggering for some. And it, and it bothers me too that the word's been co-opted by, along with lots of things, by um, some denominations, and they've kind of taken over that word and made, you th made people think that it's about worshiping something or somebody or some deity. It's not. The word means to do something together that is special, that is of worth. Um, so in Greek, there's these two words, chronos and kairos. Chronos is chronological time, just everyday, ordinary time. Kairos time is time out of time, special time. And I consider worship to be kairos time, that time out of time where we take to do something that is of worth, that is special, that feeds our souls, that we find nourishment, maybe a, 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 a sentence or a line in a poem that really speaks to you. So offering all kinds of different things in music, literature, poetry, ideas, so that you do, we each come away with having found something of worth. That's what it means to me. Yeah, and it bothers me that so many of these beautiful words have been um, co-opted and people find them uncomfortable. And if they find, you find, and because they, these words do make people feel uncomfortable, I try to use them very sparingly. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, for our final question this morning, uh, we have an event that's coming up uh, later on in May, um, an installation. So the question is, why are we having installation? What's the difference between a contract minister and a settled minister? Reverend Rosemary, I'm gonna give you a moment to think about your answer. If we can just have... <laughs> Chantal? Wait for it. So the first part of the question is, what is an installation and why are we having one? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. An installation means that um, the congregation has chosen a settled minister. So they've done the work of um, thinking about and what they, thinking about what they want, uh, what directions that this congregation might wish to go into, and then they have found a minister that will hopefully take them in those directions. So it's a celebration of a completion of that work that the congregation does, and they install. It kind of feels like an app, doesn't it? <laughs> or a software program that you install on your computer. So you, uh, an installation is basically um, a, dis uh, a celebration, a marker of the relationship, the change in the relationship between a congregation and their settled minister. So the congregation has gone through all kinds of work to find the person that they think is going to lead them in a way that they wish to be led. And so it's the congregation's celebration of finding that match. So the, in Unitarian Universalism, it's a match process. Um, so we swiped right on you. We swipe, you swiped right on me, that's right. She's, Erica said, so you swiped right on, yes, exactly. And uh, um, so it's a celebration, and you, I am your ninth settled minister. And it's basically the, a change in the relationship from and use, carrying on with the theme of swiping right. Um, 
we've kind of gone from maybe living together to getting married, <laughs> in a way. So we dated for a while, and there might have been the odd sleepover, <laughs> and then we started living together when, um, and then uh, we've now been, uh, we're, we got married really quietly about a year ago, and now we're having the party. <laughs> so it's the party, it's the reception, it's the celebration. And there's a lot of hands that are involved in that work. It's going to be lovely. And it's your celebration. I know what there was are, the other quest, part of the question? I, th I think we're good for the time being. Okay, I know there good. are many questions, and I would encourage all of you to continue this dialogue as we move forward. I would love to move into our closing hymn, if we may. Jordan, it'll take two seconds. Two seconds. Jones needs to say something. Can we do this again? Can we do this again? That was this, the question. This um, uh, question box service? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Jones for that. would like to have the question box service happen every once in a while. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. You got it. That Our, was a little anemic. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not convinced. Do you want this to happen again? Yeah. Okay. Right. And I do wish to not. Was there any questions online? I beg your pardon. No questions online. Okay. Let us go into our closing hymn. Uh, it's number 1014 in the Teal Hymn Book, Answering the Call of Love. I invite you to rise as you are willing and able as we join in singing, Answering the Call of Love. as we extinguish our flame. I offer you these words by Dana Worsnop. Often people say that they love coming to a place with so many like-minded people. I know just what they're getting at, and I know that they aren't getting it right. I want to be with a bunch of people, uh, sorry, I don't want to be with a bunch of people who think just like me. I want to be in a beloved community where I don't have to think like everyone else and still feel loved and, uh, or, and still feel loved. I want to be with people who value compassion, justice, truth, and love, though they have different thoughts and opinions about all sorts of things. I want to be with independent-minded people of good heart. I want to be with people who have many names and no names at all for God. I want to be with people who let church call them into a different way of being in the world. I want to be with people who support, encourage, and challenge each other to higher and ethical living. I want to be with people who inspire one another to follow the call of the Spirit. I want to be with people 
who covenant to be honest, engaged, and kind, who strive to keep their promises and hold me to the promises I keep. I want a people who give of themselves, who share with their hearts and minds and gifts. I want to be with people who know that human community is often warm, generous, and sometimes challenging, and almost always a grand adventure. In short, I want to be pe with people just like you. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. Before I offer words of benediction, I wish to thank you for being here and for your questions. Um, and to thank everyone that was participated and um, worked to put this service on. And thank you for being here and to those that are on, online. Thank you, Gordon, for your great... Um, it was all the, all the game show stuff was his idea. It was very fun. Made it very, very fun. And now I offer these words of benediction to you. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world, for things break, and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So please, go out and love intentionally. Love unconditionally, and love extravagantly, for the broken world waits in darkness for the love that is within you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Let us sing together our linking song, Carry the Flame. The words will appear. <laughs>